Speaking of uh, down and out, this is an interesting one, you know. The CEO of Intel said in a leaked internal memo that it was too late for them in AI. She said, on training, I think it's too late for us, confessing that Intel no longer ranks among the world's top 10 semiconductor firms and acknowledged a strategic ret retreat from high-end AI training chips to focus on edge AI. Um, which, it, wow, what a thing to leak, what a thing to say, what a thing to realize <laughs> about Intel. I guess we all realized it, but she admitted it. Just a little bit of context, and I'd love to get your feedback on this. You know, you know NVIDIA has been the clear winner of the AI super cycle. They were very well poised for the blockchain cycle uh, with their GPUs. Um, which started to, you know, ebb away, f fade away, and then AI became a thing, and they were even more positioned for that. You cannot find enough NVIDIA GPUs. And put on top of that their CUDA architecture and all of their suite of tools, NVIDIA is the AI toolmaker. They are the most valuable company in AI, period. Um, and Jensen Wong is an amazing leader. Um, I was going to say disciplined, but he's not disciplined. <laughs> he has a massive portfolio of stuff and he is a visionary and he's getting shit done and he's found his moment. Uh, Intel, who was the leader in everything, semiconductors and especially CPUs and compute, um, you know, that you may have heard of Moore's law, Intel's founder and CEO invented that thing. Um, but recent years, they've really fallen off. No one cares about Intel inside anymore. And, uh, now... Their new their CEO is admitting they are probably missed that whole boat for training. What do you what do you think of this, Yenev? It's uh it's quite an interesting admission. I think this is brilliant. And actually, you mentioned Gordon Moore. This is not the first time Intel has faced a situation like this. So if you really go back in Intel microchip history, they did not start out as a CPU microprocessor company. They started as a company making DRAM chips, so just RAM, and they were the world leader. And then they started being caught up by Taiwanese competitors and things got to a point where they were no longer the leading manufacturer of DRAM chips in the world. But they had a nice little sideline in microprocessors, what we now call CPUs. And there's a famous story about Gordon Moore and Andy Grove, the, the two leaders of Intel, where they basically were talking about what to do with their DRAM business, which was slowly losing. And they said, uh, the, the way the story is reported is one of them said to the other, if the board fired us and replaced us with two new guys, what would they do? And the other one said, they would get out of the DRAM business. And they said, and so then the first one said, well, why don't we just walk out the door, come back in and do it ourselves? And they did. They shut down the business that was at the origin of what Intel did. So they've had their backs against the wall before. Um, but I, the reason I said it's brilliant, Chris, is you can only fix your problems if you acknowledge them properly, if you admit where you've lost, so you can actually focus on the areas where you can win. And yes, Intel has been on a pretty long losing streak, but they've still got some chops, right? And so continuing to pretend they're the Intel of old and fighting, taking the fight head on against folks who are now bigger and more competent than them, that's not going to work. They need to do a strategic retreat, say, we've lost this one, that allows you to clear the deck and focus on areas where you could still win. So to me, this is good leadership, and I hope to see a lot of awesome stuff coming out of Intel. They are a true survivor of the tech industry. Yeah, I agree with you. This is very instructive for founders who are listening. Um, you know, a lot of founders struggle from a lack of focus. They're, they're hedging their bets. They're holding on to legacy ideas, legacy businesses, legacy products, legacy customers. They are struggling with sunk cost fallacy. Um, and they forget the, one of the main axioms of startup success, which is to focus on the problem, not the solution you have, right? Focus on the domain, not the particular product you have. And more importantly, focus on one key area at a time, or at least the number of areas you're actually funded to go pursue. Um, I've been obsessed with this metaphor lately, Yanev, um, with some of the companies I advise. Imagine you have like one bottle of water, uh, and two plants to water. If you... If you water both plants, they will both continue to wilt and die. But if you water just one plant, that plant may have a chance of thriving and succeeding. And too many people are watering two, three, four, five plants with limited water uh, and wondering why nothing is, is succeeding. And so you, like Intel, 
probably need to cut focus areas, products, customer types, markets, everything except the one or two things you're actually funded to execute uh, and execute the shit out of it so that that, that plant can thrive. Then you, when you walk into a VC office and you have a thriving plant, you're like, oh yeah, you're a good botanist. Maybe I'll give you some more water to go, to go build an arbor, uh, arboretum. Uh, and so that's, that's the trick of the game. And that's the trick, whether you're a startup or you're a massive Intel scale enterprise. So yeah, I think this is probably the right decision and you, she's skating to where the puck is going. So I think that's, that makes a lot of sense. All right, folks, what do you think? Is Intel making the right move here or should they keep fighting? And have you ever encountered a situation where you've made a strategic retreat only to come roaring back? Speaking about it, NVIDIA, actually, uh, they, this week, did a little visit to China, the CEO did, uh, and he had high-level meetings in Washington, and he has cleared the path to reopen China, a $10 billion market, uh, which was shut down thanks to export restrictions. Uh, you know, NVIDIA has always found a way, a loophole, a methodology for getting into China despite some amount of export contr uh, controls on their GPUs by creating kind of less lower powered variants that uh, are okay to sell in China. But at some point, I believe earlier this year, uh, the Trump administration put the kibosh on that uh, and basically choked off all sales to China. That really hurt NVIDIA's valuation and, and uh, prospects. There, there are some who believe that this is, you know, a strategically smart move, uh, that China shouldn't have access to their GPUs, and this would further hobble them and slow them down. Some, though, believe by cutting China off from the GPUs, even the crippled GPUs, that it's forcing China to innovate and create more efficient models, uh, algorithms, and their own GPUs, uh, and then sort of creating a tech stack that is anti-American or an alternative tech stack to the American tech stack. And that was actually more a kind of a game of 4D chess and, and strategically uh, disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous to the US. Um, I think some of the people who are claiming that are investors and capital allocators who want to see access to China <laughs> as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I actually think there's a good, both arguments uh, have a reasonable, a reasonable hypothesis there. But whatever, you know, it'd be interesting to debate that with you, Yanev, but it, whatever the case, NVIDIA is now able to sell something to China. And I think their stock was up big on, on the week. Um, I know I made a, a shitload of money on it. Uh, and so, you know, good news for the shareholders, good news for Jensen and NVIDIA. Um, it's unclear if it's good news strategically for the, the Western alliance. Uh, what, what do you think about all this, Yanev? I guess I don't have a strong opinion. Like I think the H20 chips were already the less powerful chips. It's clear that China doesn't have a strong dependence on these chips to be able to advance their AI agenda. And so, yeah, ultimately, I think it's just good for US companies to be able to make money from China. And if the US administration cares about balance of trade, as they very much claim to, then they shouldn't put export controls on things unless they genuinely are a national security threat. And I also think, uh, you know, this is an example of the, the so-called taco hypothesis, Trump always chickens out, which is when real money's on the line or, or real things are on the line and industry whispers in his ear, he actually is quite a pro-free trade person. Yeah, the, the other one I've heard with, from Jason Calacanis was uh, shock and bore. Um, he, you know, he makes a bunch of bluster, a bunch of declarations and all of it is for nothing. It's just chaos. And, and I think the markets and the people have started ignoring him actually. Um, he's, he's completely full of shit on every level. So yeah, I think that's right. I think necessity is the mother of invention and China has found ways to get these chips anyway. They have found ways to optimize their algorithms, um, without these chips and they have found ways, or they're investing in ways to create their own uh, chips. Uh, and so the US companies might as well benefit from them and maintain some semblance of US he hegemony. So, you know, I think, I think this is a, a good move all around uh, and uh, ultimately f fairly harmless for, you know, national security. But what do you guys think? Do you think this is a strategic blunder from the Trump administration or just getting back to business as usual? Let us know your thoughts down in the comments below.